Okay, class, today we're going to be talking about chapter 9, titled Byzantium. Um, it is pages 256 through 283 in your text, so you need to be reading those. It's an interesting chapter, and it moves on from the Roman Empire. There's definitely a strong relationship between this chapter and the previous chapter with the Roman Empire. Because if you remember before, we talked about how um, Constantine moved the moved the capital uh, from Rome to Byzantium, Byzantine, and renamed it Constantinople. It talks about the history of it in the documentary that you watched. Um, anyway, under his move, he made this whole eastern part of the Roman Empire uh, expand and grow and become very significant. He found it on the side of um, Byzantium in modern-day Istanbul and Turkey, and he was the emperor of a unified empire. It was still one whole empire. But then later on, when Theodos the first died in 395, so that was in 324 that he founded Constantinople, when a later emperor died, he split the empire east and west between his two sons, and it became two empires. Rest the west was Rome, was the main was the capital for a while, but it was sacked in 410, and then moved to Milan. the The Western Roman Empire had a capital in Milan, and then later Ravenna, and then it eventually disintegrated into warring kingdoms of other people groups that we'll kind of look at in some of the future chapters, or at least talk about them as groups. The East, which we're talking about with Byzantium, also sometimes called the Byzantine Empire, Byzantium. So you'll see these different words used. The East um, had a long history of its own and actually remained for a thousand years referred to Byzantium by historians, but they referred to themselves as Romans and the Roman Empire. So they ended they ended up considering themselves in the their whole time that they were the continuation of the Roman Empire. They didn't think of themselves differently. They that empire ended in 1453, so a thousand years, and was conquered by the Ottoman Empire. So there's an interesting cultural mix of Roman ideas, Christian ideas, and then Eastern influences in this art because of its location, its history, and then the way in which um, Constantine made Christianity legal, and then it was became the state religion, and then it became um, even more so the only religion, basically. We're going to see characteristics of the art and then distinctive things about the architecture especially. There were three periods of art that we'll talk about. The first one being 324, the founding until the onset of this huge event called Iconoclasm in 3726 under Leo III. The second one, the middle one, is the renunciation of Iconoclasm in 843 until the Western Crusaders occupied Constantinople. Okay, that's where it is in Turkey on the Bosphorus. And then later, it was the third late one is the recapture of it in 1261 until its loss in 1453. But its first golden era was under Justinian. He was called the Great and was in power. This is kind of shows you what he did before. This is how the empire was when he took the throne. And then he added all this territory through military success. His goal was to revive the empire reconquer the lost western half. He did not do it all, but he did do quite a bit of it. He's sometimes called the last Roman um, because of his values. He rewrote civil law, that is the still the basis of law in some modern states in Europe. And he his rule is, like I said, considered the first golden age of Byzantine Empire. We can see all kinds of things in this piece. Your book talks a lot about this piece as an example of him, he's on a horse. We've seen this with Roman emperors, equestrian statues. Um, he's victorious. He's receiving tribute. There's this idea of heaven blessing what he's doing um, and him defeating people. 
conquerors. So he's very much still thinking about himself in terms of Roman Roman Empire, the way in which these people were operating. This would probably be a piece from a... Um, it would have had a second piece on it, probably, a diptych. So early Byzantine art, this era, was... Um, especially we'll talk about this golden age and then we'll see in it the mix of Roman Christian and Eastern influences and we're going to especially look at the Hagia Sophia and the San, San Vitale and the mosaics and then talk a bit about some religious controversies related to imagery that develop into iconoclasm. That's the second part. So let's look at this building, San Vitale. It's essentially plain church. Um, often favored by Orthodox church, churches and Orthodox, it's a denomination, I guess you could say, or a segregation of Christianity. There's like the Eastern Orthodox and the Western Roman Catholic, and then Roman Catholic, they had breakaway with Protestants and Luther and different ones, but that's kind of one of the main splits is Eastern and West. So the Orthodox churches often prefer the central plan. You can see here the central plan idea of the apse. Sometimes they have an atrium, sometimes not. Domed areas a lot of time. And this is the main type of plan we've been looking at. This is the like old St. Peter's. So it's very different in its floor plan. And um, it gives the whole building a different feeling that we'll talk about. We're going to be looking at, especially this area here, the apse, and then some of the stuff, the mosaics inside these areas. Um, this is still the most important kind of area of the building because it's where the table is, where the priest officiates the service and the Eucharist. I don't think that they necessarily call their person a priest. They call them father. I'm not sure what they do in Orthodox, but something like that. The person who's leading the service. It's pretty plain on the outside. There's a little bit of decoration over the portal, the entrance. But overall, there's a buttressing or the thickening of the walls to help hold it up. And then there's windows to let in light which is adds beauty but overall there's not a huge focus on the exterior of the building um the essentially plain churches were often round or octangular this is an octagon and they often had a dome sometimes had an atrium sometimes not and there's a lot of circular things which are symbols of eternity and then windows in the center of it you'll see are important in a lot of these because they let in light, which is a symbolism of God, God's presence. So this is one of the greatest works, arguably the greatest work of Byzantine culture, this in the Hagia Sophia. It's essentially plain church like we've been talking about, and it radiates from that middle point. Um, it has different styles. One of them is a domed octagon. We'll see... The interior has this grand middle section with up here is that domed octagon. This is looking out from the apse. Okay, so you can see that at the extension in the apse there is an interesting mosaic. This is looking back at the apse. This is an important mosaic we're going to talk about. But you can see the kind of extraordinary, beautiful detail of colored marble and mosaic and gold used throughout this so compared to the outside which is like plain brick looking right you have a very different feeling on the inside so the interior of it the decoration of it is very important above the altar we have this youthful christ you can kind of see him there a little bit better he's sitting on an orb which is the world. It's supposed to be his second coming, youthful like Christ versus the one with the beard. Um, 
we talked about this in the last chapter, how there was a, examples of Christ in certain parts of the catacombs and such, where he was looking like more like a shepherd like David. We showed examples of that. Well, this is him, uh, second coming. He's holding in his hand the scroll with the seven seals from Revelations 5.1. And the arrangement of this is references to prophecy from the Bible about him coming back. It's it's an interesting, interesting piece, and it's important where its location is is important because it's right above where the service is. They have three windows, like the Trinity, and then these two mosaics in relation to, to that are important. You could see the light coming through, like God's presence, and how it would glitter off of the golden mosaics. So there would be a glow of yellow light. And the central core windows, the celestory windows, would be doing the same thing. The construction of this began just after the death of Theodoric, the Ostrogoth's greatest king, which he was conquered by Justinian, and he finished and updated this. It's in Ravenna, which is on the Adriatic coast um, of Italy. It's an important trading port between the east and west, an Italian center for Justinian's empire and focus of his patronage in Italy. And we'll see that's important to him because he's in these mosaics here. He never actually came to Ravenna, but he strived to bring unity to Christendom, um, and one way he was doing that was his building projects. It's dedicated to St. Vitale, who was a, a second century martyr, at the, and he was a slave first, and then he was a martyr at the hands of the Romans in Ravenna, so it's an important person to the area. So that's an important saint to the area. And you see the beauty of it and just the beauty. This mosaic we've talked about is a bunch of pieces of like stone, glass, um, gold leafing with a clear over it. You can see how it's just gorgeously reflecting light everywhere. Well, this mosaic and that mosaic we're going to see are really important because, and you can see the columns and the capitals are just finely decorated. Because here is Justinian, and on the other side is Theodora, his um, bride, his imp the empress. You can see that it's on each side of this middle, the apse here, and then this big in the dome, uh, this one of Christ that we were talking about. So the relationship's important for you to understand. Let's look at the Justinian mosaic. So... It's here in the apse, and its function is religious to show, it's religious and also political, to show Justinian as the worthy successor of Constantine. So he's bringing the bread to the altar um, for the service. He never came to the inauguration of this place, or, and he never really came to it but it's, he's permanently represented here, okay? So during the 5th century, the western part of the Roman Empire was overrun by Germanic tribes of northern Europe, and he recaptured it from the Ostrogoths in 540, like I said that. So under him, the empire in the east was rising to prominence and regaining ground, and so for him it's very important to represent himself here in this part of the world that he was not naturally, or he did not assume the empire with, them, with him as a rule. This is a conquered territory. So he wants to put himself in this place as a worthy success for, successor of the unified empire, Constantine. So it's very, very, very much a political move. Um, so these little tiles are embedded into wet cement. You can see some of them right there. And Justinian is shown in a very regal royal way. There's gold all around him. He has his halo, and he's wearing purple. And he's bringing the bread, the Eucharist wafer. You can see the detail in him. It's got naturalism in that it's a representation representation of a person, 
but it's very much more conceptual rather than trying to be realistic. Um, these mosaics were all over the building, like you, like you saw already, throughout the whole place. S walls, floors, everywhere. They're, so there really was a high art form for them. You see here that there's some interesting things happening. Okay, there's three figures that are part of the church: the bishop, and then a guy holding a jeweled um, gospel and the incense for the service. And then three state people, so part of his ruling body, shall we say. Um, and then over here is the military. So in this piece, we have this idea of he is God's representative on earth. He's carrying that platter, so he's blessed. He's blessing this place, and the bishop is um, also saying, yes, this is good. And he also has the military. And here on the military shield, this guy's shield, is an important thing to see. You can see there's a little blip right there. Okay, that symbol is called the Cairo. It's the two letters, the two first letters of Christ's name. So it's kind of basically saying he is ruling in the name of his faith in Christ. And that's being supported by the bureaucrats and the priests, and the military. The archbishop over here was named Maximum, uh, Maxim. He, you know, was the one who would have um, dedicated the church. So there's a really strong idea going on here. And I want to remind you of the context being that of him in the apse right there with Christ overhead. So it's a very strong context. You can see a lot of things about the way that they depicted figures, and we'll see this time and again, the human figure in Byzantine Christian art. We'll see a lot of commonalities. They use the figure to depict Christian ideals and beliefs Instead of like the idealism of the Greeks, where the body was shown in an ideal fashion to um, show the humanism, the body is not shown important in that way. Um, and when we had the Greeks, we had that, ex that real idealism of the human form and per that the perfection they were shooting for. Well, then in Rome, we started getting more of a sort of idea of history being important, but there was still a lot of the Greek stuff going on. But they wanted to, oftentimes we would see like portraiture and things that were historical and historical in nature propaganda, right? Um, you can think of Trajan's Column, you can think of the equestrian portrait of Marcus Aurelius. And here we're getting an idea that the body is not as important as the soul. It's almost hovering, the feeling of the feet lifting up and it's very elongated. And you can see in their eyes that they're wide or open, uh, the windows being like the eyes to the soul. So it's definitely changing. There's an idea in this of picturing the spiritual world, and you can see that through the ex lots of use of gold throughout their mosaics. And for these people making this work, humanity was not all all is wonderful was not the story like Greek work where it's humanism. Um, all is not wonderful for them with humanity. Humanity needs redemption and they humanity needs God. So they're trying to depict the spiritual world and part of how they think that should be happening in the world is through the rule of um, godly emperors basically or emperors who are put into place by God. So that's kind of what they're, part of what they're communicating. You can see the kind of details. There's still a feeling of like movement throughout it, the cloak that he's wearing. And you can see that all these little pieces. Um, this work is often very frontal. There's the eyes close up right there. You can see the, all the little pieces. The work is very frontal in nature. Um, not idealized like the Greeks. It's 
not anatomically correct. No one's naked because there's piety. There's not contrapposto. So it's a real body in need of salvation, not an idealized body. But the importance of the soul and the eternal rewards are very important here. Um, and it's sort of a luxury that goes with it with the gold to show ideas. The body has a sort of sense of lightness and floating up. And the soul is the one with the important substance. That's, and you can kind of see there is drapery happening, but it doesn't have this ex real articulation of the form beneath it. It's sort of more just patterning. Okay. So a lot of symbolism happening here with gold in the back. And Justinian is the head of the church. You can see through this idea that he's the head the unification of the church and the state and the military. So he's the head of it all. So a secondary main idea is that's the one of the secondary main ideas of the whole building is his rati the ratification of his right to rule. But the main one is still for them the idea of the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus for these people. Um, being a, this being a reenactment of that and the main idea for them is still that Christ here he is is going to be coming back and his his body and blood is being served to redeem humanity and that's a reenactment in the in the Eucharist so it's still that is still the main focal point of the whole cathedral and you see it throughout lots of different places and his presence with the gold and light but the secondary one is very strongly that um he's the he has the right to rule and his rule has been ratified on the other side and this is part of it is that there's a bishop and the priests being part of it in the name you know with the cross and the symbols of the service the jewel bible this incense all these things on the other side which would be Christ's left, just anyone was on Christ's right, if you were facing out from the apse, is Theodora. Okay, so it's as if he and his wife were coming to the opening ceremony of the church, and in some way are continually a part of it, um, did not come in life, but here it is. There's Christ above them here, and then if the people in the service are standing in front of um, the bishop or somebody hosting the service, and they're part of this whole long lineage still, too. There's a kind of um, continuation by having these mosaics here. It's a commentary and something that people would know and interpret back then. Okay. This has a lot of the same stylistic concerns, and it's in the same general area of the building, but on the opposite side from the Justinian mosaic. She was the wife of the emperor. And you can see this straight on version. Here she is at the center. So both of them have the um, main figures at the center for the most important thing, person at the center. Over here are some ladies in waiting, fitting with her position. She's the one who's going to be placing the wine on the altar for the service. So she's bringing the second half of the other half of the Eucharist. Her purple robe is also representing royalty and matches Justinian's and Christ. Um, interesting, down here on her robe, it's hard to see, but there's a three magi, which are from uh, Christ's birth story in the Bible, uh, the three kings who come and bring him gifts. So she's getting quite a lot of... Um, accolade in this to say that she is part of someone who's bringing gifts to Christ and a worthy empress. Um, two officials are holding back, here they are, the curtain for her to enter after Justinian. So the idea of her rank coming in second is being shown. And this would be something like a baptistry, a sprinkling, sprinkling not immersion. So this is kind of communicating ideas of rebirth and conversion to the faith. Um, one of the two 
agreed upon sacraments by all denominations are the Eucharist or called communion and baptism. So, and then on the right side are her ladies in waiting over here, um, which would be usual for her position of power. This is pretty in, in, interesting for her to be in a mosaic. It really, it's pretty rare if you think about it. We haven't seen a lot of women in power being shown in things. And this really shows how much Justinian valued his wife. She was said to be his most trusted advisor and was described by her contemporaries as being a really, really exceptionally intelligent woman. So she's one of the uh, one of the women we know more about from art from history because of her position. You can see close up the wine being brought and the detail and like the jewelry and the finery that they're wearing. There she is. Same type of ideas of the body, the wind, the eyes of the soul, the eyes are the windows of the soul wide open. And you get a lot of detail of pattern and the dresses of the ladies in waiting. Whoever did this obviously, you know, really had a high, high degree of artistry and detail, like things like a ring on the finger. And definitely very stylized geometric quality to the way that they're doing this. The same thing, the body is not really articulated with the fabric falling over it. It's just a lot of really sumptuous patterns. You don't get a lot of the female form coming through or the male form coming through on either side of it, which we have seen quite a lot of that in other cultures. So this is a different consideration and it matches what we're talking about with the soul being more important and this sort of same feeling of the feet floating up is still happening so there's a common handling of the figure okay we're going to look now at a church that's um in istanbul it's modern day istanbul which would be called you know constantinople byzantine byzantium it's called the hagia sophia it's um a building project of justinian he had a really extensive an ambitious building program throughout the empire like he did with Ravenna, uh, with San Vitale. Same thing. This one's in his capital, though. It was, it is, its function originally, like the last piece, was a place of worship as a Christian Orthodox church. Um, now, it has been changed over the years and is no longer uh, operational that way. It's operational as a museum at the moment. It was in between after it was conquered by the um, Ottoman Empire, conquered the Byzantine Empire. It was transformed into a mosque for a while as well, which we'll see the effects of that because this is four minarets on the outside, which are used to call the faithful to prayer in Islam. So those are later additions. So the building is not exactly as it was when Justinian built it, but a lot of it is intact. It's a very impressive building, and you can see most of it's stone and brick. Um, the outside is pretty imp pretty impressive, mostly because of these giant domes, but there's not a lot of like relief sculpture and decoration. kind of continues on with the same sort of feeling of uh, it not it being about the inside more than the outside. We do know the architects um, of it, and they weren't necessarily traditionally trained architects, but they um, solved a lot of problems. Your book talks more about that. And we're going to look at one of the kind of distinctive features and interesting things that they figured out in this building and other buildings that allowed them to have what we would call a combined footprint of the longitudinal of the Basilica Church mixed with the central plan dome. This is looking down the middle of it. So you can see, looking at the apsis, you got the still longitudinal, but then you have the central planned dome. And so this is a very interesting thing. It allowed them to do two traditions together, a domed basilica, basically. And that's that's the ground plan of it. The apps here, we're looking in this way. 
And the thing that allows them to have that are what we call the pendentives, which we're going to see. This is a cutaway view of it. Kind of a really beautiful building. So this has a dome on pendentives. These are the pendentives. This is the dome, the pendentives, and this is a drum. Your book talks about them a fair amount. You could see them here inside when you're looking inside. So what is it about these pendentives that's so important and a big architectural, you know, invention, so to speak? They did it in other ways, too. Your book talks about squinches, but these are the ones we're going to talk the most about. What it is is it directs the weight of the dome to these four pillars, okay? And these triangular segments that are also concave, if you think about it, let's draw here. They look like if you had another dome here, they would be part of the dome. But it's as if they made another part of the dome and then cut away um, arches out of it and then made a circle at the top to add another dome. What do they do? They allow you to put a dome on top of a square. So they allow you to have a dome, a drum, and a square together. And that allowed them to combine the footprints. It's a transition between a square or polygonal base and the dome. So uh, it's really, really important um, because it allowed them to do this new way of building that they were really going for, which was a combination of the two. Why bother with it? Why did they want to do it? The central dome has all these beautiful celestory windows in it. And if you see the inside of it, there's half domes off the other side. So that's where they have the apse and different types of areas around. If you look at it, it is a giant space, huge space, and lets in this beautiful light. People talk about this as if it was a dome floating on light because of all these windows inside of it. And this high central dome has 40 windows at the base, so it's like a halo of light. And if we remember circles and light being God's presence to these people, symbolism of that, then it makes sense why they're so interested in this. The nave is this huge open central area, and there's side aisles and things over here. But that gives it a grand feeling. Justinian was trying to build a church that would be as important secondarily, but like in its own way, importance like the temple in Jerusalem. And he was really ambitious with this. So he's trying to make something like it's a um, glorious grand space to worship God and celebrate in another way also his um, empire. So if people talked about if the dome was as if it would come down on a golden chain from heaven, that's a quote from somebody in that era. It's Interior walls had paintings and mosaics. It's very magnificent, especially in its original state, which it's been damaged and changed some. There's marble on different marble and colors of stone throughout it. Um, this is, uh, like I said, these Arabic symbols and placards have been added later when it was turned into a mosque. And with the dome, there's all these arches, if you see. And that's the idea that it's like a archway into heaven idea. And windows letting in light are awe-inspiring. And so there's an idea of, if you think about the Orthodox service with the incense and the chanting and singing and all this beautiful grandeur, then there's a definite idea of like mysterious, mystical, God's presence and light that they're trying to really create here. And you can just see the amount of covering of surfaces with beautiful stone. Those are those, this next level up shows you all the windows and light. Things have been damaged, but you can see the type of mosaics and painting that are bright and colorful. And then the screens with beautiful scroll work. So you can get really an idea when you're looking at it like, okay, they're doing this for a real reason. Um, it's 
One of the greatest architectural con contributions of the Byzantine Empire, probably the greatest actually, besides Saint Vitaly, and it's the first time in history a dome in, in pendentives appears in architecture, and it's famous for its exterior buttressing of the 40 windows rather than on the inside, which allows for this vast space. What do I mean? See how the space is vast and not really ruined by very many columns? They just kind of come down a little bit. Well, that's because of the exterior buttressing out here. What is it? What would show it the best? Here we go. Yeah, the buttressing is on the outside, the thickening of the walls to hold it, which allows that really vast space to not be interrupted as much. So you can see in this piece um, some of their really huge concerns. And in a way, we also see the transition of this part of the world from a Christian empire, the Byzantine Empire, to the Ottoman Empire when it was made into a mosque and now a museum. And we're also going to see in part two some some different types of mosaics that were added and taken away from it, um, which is part of the history of the Byzantine Empire as well. But this takes us through part one. Um, so you're going to want to go to part two and continue continue on with me going through this chapter and we're going to look at some other icons um, and some mosaics as well as some illuminated manuscripts and some paintings and things that were done in different parts, different the middle and late Byzantian eras. But these are two of the most impressive um, buildings and they're both done in the early part under Justinian. And we'll see some other types of paintings and things from the early era too. But these give us a sort of idea about the way they viewed the figure and who he was as a person and the kind of heyday of the Byzantine Empire. All right, guys, take care. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm available in all the ways you can contact me. And I hope you're doing well out there.